Hey, everybody. So this is the crew that decided not to go to lunch. Y'all hungry? All right, hang in there. You're about to get fed, but maybe not with food. Because uh, Robert and Vu are... Well, you're here, so I have a feeling you have a reasonable expectation to know who these two gentlemen are. Is that a fair approximation? Yeah? You all having a good time? How were the dialogues? How were the, the first learning labs? Thumbs up? Thumbs up? All right. So after this, just a little piece of housekeeping, I'll come back and remind you this as we're wrapping up. You're going to go to lunch. You can do that inside or outside. You can wander down to Pike's Place. I won't tell your mom uh, or your boss. Uh, but then we have a whole afternoon of really amazing stuff. We'll close the day with Stephanie Land, who's the woman who wrote the amazing book, Made. And maybe if, you don't, if you're not much of a reader, maybe you caught the Netflix series. But a lot of really great stuff ahead today, and then some really incredible stuff tomorrow. We'll talk about that. Any questions bubbling up for folks that I can answer before I hop off stage? Let me take a quick peek. No, people seem to be happy and satisfied. All right, well, then, hell, you don't want to listen to me. Robert, Vu, why don't you do your thing? Come on out. everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I am Vu. I use he, him pronouns. And I, for colleagues who are watching maybe live stream or who are blind and have low vision, it's helpful to describe what we look like. So I just think of a mid-aged Asian man with short hair, pervasive aura of vegan sexiness. It's really <laughs> subtle, but it's there. I'm really glad to be here with my friend Robert here. Robert. Oh, hey, dudes. My name is Robert. Uh, I am a he, him. Um, I am, for those who are not uh, seeing us live, uh, I am a, just a bad motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> and um, I also hail from New Mexico, which on Indigenous People Week, I want to acknowledge that is the home, particularly where I live, of the Tiwa people. And it's also uh, the oldest Paleolithic mine site in America. It's where turquoise was first mined in the year 600. Awesome, and thank you. We are on Coast Salish land here in Seattle. And uh, this week was Indigenous Peoples Day, so just, we just want to acknowledge that. Right on. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's been a long time since I've been actually in live conversations with folks, and I, I really miss you all. And I also miss, like, the uh, vendor tables where I could get all the chapsticks. Uh, <laughs> like, I got really chapped lips during the <laughs> pandemic. And are there vendor tables here? No? Okay, well. Uh, well dude, plus, I think we got, like, almost chapped souls being away from each other for so long, because we are social beings. In fact, you know, dudes, it's funny, I understand many of you all miss lunch, but there's a deeper hunger, you know, and that's hunger for a sense of community and impact and purpose, and that's what we hope we can have a feast today as we hang out and chat, old friends. Absolutely. Um, I think we were planning to just sit down and just have a conversation with you all, but Robert here might stand up and walk around a bit. So. Um, yeah, I just, you know, but dude, you know, it's so funny, man, I, I'm an old dude, you know, I'm an elder ally. And I've worked really hard to be an elder ally, but my time um, of almost 20 years of, of dozens and thousands, actually, of, of keynotes, it's my time has passed. And I think that's very important that, that elders, and particularly older white dudes, step aside. Um, and so it's an honor to be here with Vu, because Vu is out in it all the time now. Um, but before I, I kind of begin this, I just wanted to, just, I'm going to stand up for just a second real quick, because it's like, you know, this is, oh, you don't have to stand up, dude. No, 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 you be you, you be you. But... Dudes, I mean, this is a communications thing. And I've done thousands of these. And you know, somebody, sometimes people will come up like a year later, five years later, and it's like, dude, I was at this speech you did, and it really, you spoke to me. And it's like, I wish I had known it then. You know, and communication is a real two-way street. And, and for many of us who do this, there's that sense of, is this resonating? So dude, today, please, I'm gonna do something I've never done. Um, but if you hear something you like, you know, literally, I know, I was here earlier, you know, we've been trained to do like little applause, you know, that kind of thing. Fucking let it out, you know? So if you hear something you like, literally yell it out, fuck yeah, you know, fuck yeah. So, you know, 
as a test, I mean, if I was to say, dude, I think everyone in communications, because it's the most powerful meeting for getting ideas and, and new thoughts out and helping people overcome fears, I think everyone in the business should get a triple raise when they get back. You would say, yeah. fuck yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah. Okay, so here we go. But, but feed us, dudes. Feed us. Let us know that what we're saying, you know, is, is floating your boat. So, dude, you've been out. Um, much more than I. And so, like, I mean, I, I just love to know, you've been in front of an audience. What are you seeing out there? What, what's, what is your take on what people want or need in our sector right now? Yeah, thanks, Robert. I've been on the road, everyone, for the past three weeks. I was in Halifax dodging Hurricane Fiona. And then I went to Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is really cool. And then I stopped in Monterey, California. And what I, what I noticed is just, first of all, I know I complain a lot about our sector on my blog, Nonprofit AF, right? Um, which stands for Nonprofit and Fearless. I thought it was Nonprofit as fuck. Yeah. All and, these and years, fearless. I thought it was Nonprofit as fuck. Okay, anyway, you learned some. <laughs> yeah, but what I realized is that everyone is amazing, and I really love our sector, right? Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck, fuck yeah. yeah. Our sector is amazing. And over the past several years, we've just been so creative. And we, have, we, have, we are probably the most creative sector of, of all of them. I've been watching Chopped. Do you watch Chopped? No. Okay, Chopped. Is I anyone here chops, watches bro. Chopped? <laughs> right. It's a, it's a show where you have like different baskets of um, ingredients, right? All these contestants, and they have to like find ways to make an entree out of it. And you would appreciate this, uh, you know, because you're a chef, right? And it's like, here's a trout and some marshmallow peeps. Go and make a dessert. Right. And they managed to do that. And it reminds me of our sector, right? Everywhere I went, it's like, Here's $5,000 that you can only spend on paper clips on Tuesdays. Go end homelessness. <laughs> right. And we managed to do that. Like, everyone here is so creative, and the pandemic has forced us to be even more creative. And I'm just genuinely very appreciative of our sector because we've been holding it down, right? Everything is fucked up, and we're just like out there doing our work and like supporting families and filling in the gaps left behind by government sometimes. And I'm just, I just want to start by saying how much I deeply appreciate you all, and you're amazing. Right on, dude. Right on. You know, it's funny, dude, because, you know, um, it, we're, we're just going to riff here, but um, I was just at the White House conference, the first White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health in 50 years. Um, and, and again, dude, I, I respect and appreciate our president. Um, but as is often the case, when he came out and spoke, he said, you all are doing the Lord's work. And for many of us, it's like, no, dude, we're doing the government's work, you know? Uh, <laughs> Fuck yeah. We're doing what government should be doing. I mean, I had to, I had to deal early in my career running the DC Kitchen uh, of saying, in effect, you know, I've worked really hard to make this super efficient, um, you know, powerful, just, and using food to elevate and liberate people. But at the end of the day, I'm taking leftover food and feeding working poor people leftover food. That, you know, no matter how fucking efficient I make it, that's never going to be right. You know, but that idea of, of, of our sector's need to speak more truth to power. And, you know, you mentioned New Zealand, and, uh, you know, you all might know, know this, but, you know, there's a minister of the third sector in New Zealand. The UK, Canada, Scotland, Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia all have a minister whose daily job is to help and, and, and really work alongside our sector. Did you, uh, by any chance, experience or did you? I did, yeah. New Zealand has a minister, uh, Minister Radhakrishnan. She is really cool. She sat in front of me uh, kind of intimidatingly while I gave my speech. And uh, yeah, I think, I think the point is like other countries maybe take the sector a little bit more seriously than we do. They have a minister in the cabinet whose job is to look out for the charitable sector. And we don't have anything like that here. No, and in fact, you know, geez, I, 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 I had a pack a couple of years ago. Um, and again, dude, I had no business running a pack, but I, I've, I've constantly been intrigued by this idea of why, why doesn't our sector have more representation? And um, so I started this pack, and the idea was it'll be like Kiva. You know, what we'll do is we will um, data mine and find all the different people who are running for office who either have either run a nonprofit, speak with some intelligence and depth about the role the nonprofit sector plays, or more importantly, somebody who would actually say, I'll have somebody on my cabinet. Day to day, their entire job will be to partner with the nonprofit sector to bring more resources to the community to make the community more just. Um, but anyway, our motto, and I wore this today, I haven't worn it, but it's no profits without nonprofits. And this is probably, if you all take any, no, fuck yeah. <laughs> but I mean, this is probably the most powerful economic message I have ever, could ever deliver. Because it's so 
to me, it's, 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 it's the nub of what we should be talking about. If you live in a town and there isn't communities of faith, arts and culture, healthcare, education, people working for equitable society, inclusive society, um, all of these things, there's no money. You can't make money in a town without us. We set our work, um, the work that we've struggled for two years to continue, um, and we were struggling before. Um, you know, our work is essential. You cannot make money without us. Yet, we have been trained to think our entire, uh, the only way we can function is if we go to the companies that we have allowed or we have supported to make profit and say, can we have a little of what you have left over, you know, to set the stage for you to make more money. And the idea is, wouldn't it be powerful if we could elect a new generation of mayors, uh, governors, even presidents, who saw us as equal to for-profit, this idea that the, we are the yin and yang of every good community, and would, would see us not as, you know, kind of doers of good deeds or doing the Lord's work, but, but again, essential economic partners in rebuilding this country. Uh, and I think that's what we need. So um, that idea of a minister of the third sector, I think it's so much closer than we think it could be, but there is that, that essential need for collective action. Yeah, I think that we're a little bit too nice. I mean, you, you often remind us, Robert, that of the economic power of the sector, right? We, are, we contribute $900 billion to the economy every year. We are 6% of the GDP, and we are the third largest sector. We employ 10% of the workforce, and we're oftentimes invisible. I liken our sector to, like, air, and other sectors, like the for-profit sector, to, like, food, right? People see food. They take pictures of food. They call themselves foodies, right? But the work that we all do is like air, as this, as, and people don't really appreciate air until they need it, until it's gone. And that's what our sector is, right? And because we're very nice, we tend to attract very nice and obviously extremely good-looking people. <laughs> we don't push back on it, right? We don't, we don't push back and it's like, yeah, you, like, you need to like, like for example, I'm getting very tired of the bisplaining that happens in the sector, right? Bisplaining is what my friend Alison Carney calls it when what a, a for-profit talks down to a non-profit, as if we had no idea what we're doing. Like, do you do this thing we do in non-profit? I mean, for-profit, we call it accounting. Have you, have you heard of accounting? <laughs> right. It's like, of course we've heard of accounting. We're like the best accountants in the entire world. When you're forced to Frankenstein bits of funding together and then like play funding Sudoku on a daily basis, <laughs> right? So I, I feel like we have been way too nice and we've been putting out way too much bullshit in the sector and I, we need to just like dispense with all the bullshit because there's just so much at stake right now that we just cannot afford to like be humble anymore. Fuck yeah. Let's, let's, let's take this down to a real hardcore thing, sisters. We are the feminized part of the American economy. 70% of nonprofits are founded by, led by women. 70% of volunteers are women. What we're dealing with is economic sexism. We've been, we've been told if you, are, if you do benign charity work and you jump through our hoops, we'll give you a little of the leftover money. But we're never gonna give you economic power. We're never gonna give you money to fight for economic justice, let alone advocacy. So to a certain extent, our liberation is bound up, I think, quite honestly, in the Me Too movement. We are the feminized part and sisters. We need to effectively say until our sector has the same rights and the same opportunities, the same access to capital, that our for-profit brethren have, you know, that should be our fight. Not can we, can, you know, we're literally put into the pit to fight one another for grants. I mean, literally we compete with one another when in actuality we have so much more to gain by that sense of shared destiny, that we have more to gain by standing together in, at strategic moments. But I would like to just add one analogy here because this morning when Wally was speaking, there was a, a question from the audience and a woman made, um, a, a very poignant point that the, the women's soccer fucking win. You know, they win. You know, it's like, how on earth? But I was thinking about that idea of, of how much we are like women's soccer players, metaphorically, in that, you know, for those of you who like soccer, and I like soccer, you know, when you, I can't even watch men's soccer anymore because they roll around on the ground with these bullshit fake, you know it's fake. It's like watching, quite frankly, the Republican Party at this point. They're gonna roll around <laughs> with this sense of, ow, ow, I've been canceled, ow, you know, ref, come in and save me. And the women's team, have you noticed? Women's team, they get, somebody gets knocked down, they get the fuck back up and get in the game because they're there to win. 
You know, and I think we need to recognize that we are, that's who we are. We are people who, who, and again, time and time again, we get knocked down, yet we get back up and we run back into our communities uh, to do the work we do. And again, there's a million of us doing powerful work, but I think for many of us, there's a sense of the collective opportunity we have, and so much of that is going to be on our messaging. You know, that idea of how do we speak about ourselves? Yeah, I don't know anything about soccer, y'all. I'm, I'm vegan. I don't have the energy. <laughs> uh, but before we move into, like, what do we need to do? I, I think I want to illustrate just how much of a, like, other sectors are able to, to really use their voices and things, you know? Um, and how humble we are. Like, I, I think about Juicero, right? Have, who has heard of Juicero? Okay, Juicero was a Wi-Fi connected juicing machine. That was, that was uh, think about this, a Wi-Fi connected juicing machine that was started in Silicon Valley. And you buy the $700 juicing machine, and you buy these proprietary packets of cut up fruit and vegetables, and you put it into this machine, and it, and, and, and it squeezes out one glass of juice per packet. And Bloomberg did an investigation where they discovered that you can just squeeze the packets by hand and get the same amount of juice. <laughs> so they wrote about this, and Juicero went bankrupt. But before they did, they were boasting that they had $125 million in venture capital, that they had 50 full-time engineers working to design this shitty Wi-Fi connected juicing machine, <laughs> right? Meanwhile, some of us are out there, it's like, can we please get $19 to end poverty? <laughs> and then the funders are like, um, no, you can get $2, okay? And you have to like, and it'll take nine months for us to decide. To whether to give you two dollars, right? This is what we're dealing with, and I feel like we can talk about what do we need to do, but I feel like we have to really own our power, and we, we have to really start talking about like the bullshit that we just no longer have time to endure anymore in this sector. Right? We don't have time to endure like shitty grant-making practices where we spend hundreds of hours translating. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah. yeah, the same grant application answers from one proposal to another because. Funders believe they have a, like a right to special snowflake grant applications, <laughs> right? And also like the funders who are just like, we're just saving, a, you know, we're only giving out 5% of our funds because we're saving 95% for future funds or whatever. That's, that's ridiculous. When there's like so many fires that we need to put out right now, when democracy is dying, we don't have, we don't have the luxury to doubt ourselves or to... You just play softball with people, with donors, with funders, with the public anymore. Oh, dude, I so fucking agree. I mean, this is, this is, no, I mean, dude. Are you just adding F words just for fun? No, now? <laughs> no the, sound, the sound people have a bet on, on who will do it the most, so I'm hedging the bets a little bit. No, but seriously, dudes, I think, I, you know, I've worked in, in hunger relief my entire career, and, and 25 of those in the basement of the biggest shelter in America. Um, and, you know, the, the and, you know, I make an analogy here. My, my great friend and partner, Jose Andreas, in World Central Kitchen. Um, yes. Did you just name drop Jose Andreas? Well, I mean, you know, come on, dude. You got to work <laughs> with what you got. Um, no, but it's, it's fascinating because, you know, um, he is, you know, we've worked together for almost 28 years now. Uh, but, you know, one of the, the models has always been, quite frankly, whatever charity does, we're going to do the opposite. And um, so, for example, in particular to our work now at World Central Kitchen, um, you know, when we first arrived in Haiti and then in Puerto Rico in the first real big disaster relief, uh, the, the status quo organizations and governmental organizations who thought this was their domain and our model is the model. Uh, but their model involved importing food, which in effect, to our way of thinking, was actually limiting the economic recovery of the town in the name, to feed the, in the name of feeding the town, oftentimes processed food shipped in from America. And our model was like, fuck that, let's go in and buy local food, let's employ local chefs, let's organize local restaurants, and will we, re we will re rebuild the economy at the same time we are serving people who are in bad ways because of that. But there's two things that are really powerful about this. Um, and I became fascinated um, because in these disasters, and the, me the metaphor is our country is in a disaster. I mean, sometimes we wait and we allow, and we pour money when there's a, a visible earthquake or, or a hurricane or a fire. Yet we won't when there's a, stuff, there's a raging blaze going here. How, you know, how do we, in effect, loosen the rules and allow things to, to really dynamic experiments happen? But Jose literally had to go up against FEMA and the Red Cross, who in effect said, you're just a charity. You know, we are the pros here. And I know Red Cross is a charity too, and they're fine people. 
Uh, but it was fascinating to watch how rigid people held on um, to their sense of this is the way it works. In fact, I started DC Kitchen. I didn't want to do it. I, was, I ran nightclubs. But I was just a guy who knew how much, how much food we threw away, but also knew how many people we employed. So thought, why don't we create a cooking school for the homeless so we can, in effect, offer people a chance to come in out of the rain and be part of the solution versus perennial recipients of well-intended charity. But both models had to fight. Uh, and I think that's very much at stake here is, is to a certain extent, in our, in our glory, the sector does need some elders to stand aside and say, for all of our intent, the, the, the garden we sought hasn't been realized. So maybe it's our time to step aside. And that can be both an individual leader, but it can also be an organizational leader. You know, there's times when we have to realize it's a new generation's moment uh, and that the best thing we can do is sometimes say, and I've said this many times, one of the worst failures I've ever seen has been my generation's version of success. Yeah. You know, fuck yeah. yeah. You know, we've been raised to think, man, if I just made more money, then I can give it away to charity versus, wait, why don't I start a business? In fact, that the, the way I treat my employees, the way I support the local economy, the way I reinvest profit, to me, that's my philanthropy is the day-to-day -day work I do, not the check I write at the end of the year. And I think there's these powerful new ideas about philanthropy that desperately need some air, you know, and funding. And, and I think we were talking earlier, fuck yeah, I'll go with that. But I mean, um, you know, it's funny, we were talking earlier about how um, obvious that conservative foundations, um, if they see something, they will pour money into it. They will say five-year funding, you don't have to come back, go forth and, and, and destroy. Um, I know that's probably harsh, but where we get in effect, you might say, I need $50,000 to do some basic innovation, and it'll be like, here's 10,000, come back next year with a long report about how you used it. And I think we're not funded for success, you know, or the kind of bold, dynamic work we need to do. First of all, you ran nightclubs? Yeah, I do. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but dude, get this music. And I'm sort of jump, I know it's your turn, but. No, no, night, go ahead. I you, were, you all were at MPOP, right, last night? Most of you all? Did you all walk around and look at the exhibits? I mean, for me personally, there was, I, you know, I always pay homage to Jimi Hendrix Woodstock guitar. But I was walking around, I was looking, and I must admit I was drawn to Woody Guthrie's guitar. And you may remember Woody Guthrie had on his guitar, this machine kills fascists. You know, and he was a communicator, just like you, just like me. But to me, music was about that. That music that oftentimes as a young man, I was, I was 10 years old when Dr. King and, and Robert Kennedy were assassinated, murdered, two months apart. And as a young man, I thought, how, these two guys were, were just talking about what could it be like if our country moved beyond race and uh, generations and class and found common cause. How could they be murdered? And as I grew older, it's like, these ideas can't just go away. Uh, and I get that people were fearful, um, but maybe we can use, I could use music as a way to inspire people to think different thoughts by disguising the kind of the Trojan horse. Can I disguise powerful ideas just enough to get people to hear it? You know, I oftentimes say, I'm not in the nonprofit business. I'm in the bravery business. You know, my job is to make people brave enough to see themselves, their community, their neighbors differently. Uh, and it's easy sometimes to judge. You can't see it, but years ago, I'm looking to see if it's on the screen, but years ago, I got this little tattoo of a heart on my finger here. So when I do this, it's like, don't be a hater, dude. You know, most people aren't bad people, they're just afraid. And, and the reality is, the way we communicate can help people who see their neighbor as the other, who see new Americans as a threat, who see men and women who serve their time and are returning citizens as somebody I can't live next to, somebody in recovery who needs to do it over there. Communication helps people become brave enough to say, I'll try that this is my neighbor, you know, this is, this is who we should be. And so I think that power of communications to really, and, and I would urge you to leave and think about how can I necessarily, not make people like my organization better, but how can I make them brave enough to like their neighbor better? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Mm, fuck yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up fascism here, Robert, because I think, I think that we are not willing as a sector to really confront what we're fighting here yeah. in, in the sector, right? There has been a rise of fascism and neo-fascism and neo-Nazism. And just hate, and, just flat And out. hatred hate. and, no, and things, and no, we just, no, no, no. We, don't, we don't talk about it. I no. think in some ways we become this, we, we become a force to conscience launder for a lot of inequities in our sector. 
right? Our fundraising is about like making donors feel good. And when the reality is that they really should be like making reparations for slavery and stolen and, you know, and returning stolen indigenous land. Like in New Zealand, when I was over there, there was like a land back movement, but like the government's literally buying land and returning it back to indigenous tribes back over there. Like that's what we should be doing as a sector, but instead we're, we become the Sky Mall catalog for the privilege, right? Where we're like, oh, this is my cause, and, and we use marketing as a way to get the attention of donors, you know? And so all of us just competing for the attention of donors versus like all of us actually embracing our roles as agents of justice and using our communication skills as a way to really advance equity and justice. And sometimes that includes just saying, you know, fuck donors, right? Because if they're not aligned with what we're trying to do, then no, we are not going to cater to them. Like, I, I feel like we have to, we are at this existential crisis right now where there's just so much going on. And I, I, I kind of see us as like the Avengers, you know, in Marvel's The Avengers, right? With all these superheroes with amazing superpower, communication, power, superpowers, and so on. And Thanos is just like out there and, and winning. And then all of us are like, I don't know, imagine if like Iron Man is like, I'm just going to give up 5% of my wealth to fight Thanos because I'm saving 95% for future Thanoses, you know? <laughs> and then Captain Marvel is like, I know what we should do. We should like launch a two-year think tank <laughs> to, to find out who will be most likely to be killed by Thanos. And then... Two years later, there's like a white paper that comes out. It's like, guess what, everyone? It's a black people and indigenous people and women of color and disabled people and LGBTQIA folks who are going to be most likely to be killed by Thanos. And our sector's like, yay, look at this amazing white paper. That, this is progress. Let's have an entire conference on this white paper. And then Dr. Strange is like, y'all, it's just... Why, why are we talking about politics? It's just too political to say that we're fighting Thanos. And also, can't we just meet in the middle with Thanos? <laughs> right? And then Black Panther's like, what the hell, y'all? Like, come on! <laughs> this is what's been happening in our sector. We've become this, like, white moderate sector. Remember well, that? and again, at the end of the day, Thanos now has the Supreme Court. <laughs> you know? So, and again, to a certain extent, while we're talking, while we're ruminating, while we're having conferences, you know, while we're sipping coffee in the lobby, um, there are forces at work every single moment we're doing this that are going to, that have a goal. And the goal is antithetical to what we believe community stands for, justice stands for, and we should be warriors for this. You know, um, once, I just wanted this idea though of, of like the donor and, and, and the way they're treated. A, I mentioned earlier, um, and, and far be it for me as a white dude to talk about women and women's empowerment, but if you study, I love independence movements, but if you realize that in the 72 years between the Seneca Falls Convention, in which women that included Sojourner Truth, uh, and a wife, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, just a lot of people, and Frederick Dulles, they were all there to talk about the nexus between abolition and suffrage. But it took 72 years, sisters, 72 years between that and the 19th Amendment. And the majority of the time, those suffragettes were trying to convince other women they had the right to vote, not men, other women, because women had told for so long they couldn't, they thought they shouldn't. And I think that's us, that we've been told, we've been put in this box, and we've accepted this up box, that we are only worthy of what is left over at the end of the month. And, and again, trained to say, if I am submissive, if I, if I don't push too hard, I'll get that grant, versus that idea of how far are we willing to go to risk it all? You know, um, we have talked many times as a sector about the lack of diversity in our sector. And I think that's, frankly, exhibit A, that our sector is viewed by communities of color more as well-intended tools of the man, not agents of the people. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, we need to be visibly much more willing to risk what we have. Uh, you know, when you think about, there isn't a nonprofit office you go into where there isn't a picture of Dr. King or Mahatma Gandhi. And if you're really badass, Malcolm X, you know, or Sojourner Truth, or a thousand other beautiful, powerful leaders. But how often are we willing to even embrace even the slightest iota of risk that those leaders took? You know, Dr. King had fucking firebombs thrown in his house where his children slept. You know, Gandhi was in prison time and time again. And not that kind of prison that you see on movies where the British are like, oh, let Gandhi out. They kept him in prison. 
you know, but that kind of risk, that's what made leaders of those men. And I think that the more we demonstrate through ferocious activism or just commitment to say, in effect, I will not submit for money. You know, I will not turn my back on community for a grant. Now, that's been easy for me to say because the buildings, I, the businesses I ran always had a business attached so that I could, in effect, raise enough money to speak more truth to power than most. And I was very much a white dude in America who ran a business in the nation's capital with high visibility. And that brought with it certain incomes and certain opportunities that most nonprofits don't get. So I don't want to sound like if I did it, you can too. But that sense of I'm willing to risk something for the greater good, the collective good, um, I think that's what's been missing from our sector, a, a demonstration of a, a, a commitment beyond words, to be quite frank. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Dr. King, because I, I think one of the, we always bring, bring him up, right? But we don't really talk enough about his quotes about the white moderate, right? Where he warned that the biggest threat towards justice is not like the people wearing hoods and burning crosses. It's like the white moderate, the very well-meaning folks who are just standing on the side and saying, yeah, you know, I really, I really believe in equity and justice, but like, can we be nicer? Can we be more civil? Can we not ruffle any feathers? And he said that those folks are the biggest threat to justice. And I think in some ways, our sector has become one giant white moderate sector. And we had to figure out how do we actually break out of this? And I don't think we can actually do that unless we acknowledge that we are in many ways complicit because we benefit from the existence of inequity, right? Oh, dude. We, our jobs depend on inequity existing so that we get paid to fight it. So if we're not willing to acknowledge that, then I think it's going to be very difficult for us to mitigate this. And this is what's been happening in our sector. We use different things um, as a way to kind of uh, avoid talking about how much of a white moderate we have all become as a sector. It's hard right. to look in the mirror, you know, yeah. as Michael Jackson said, man, it's, it's the man, I'm looking at the man in the mirror, and I think our sector sometimes, we want to think this is what we look like versus this is really, and again, dudes, this is not, you know, we both love this sector. By the way, dude, it's such a good joy to hang with you, brother. I haven't seen, we haven't seen each other in too long. Um, you know, when I first started, the reason I got involved in this is because my, uh, my wife, who was in the back uh, today, um, we wanted to get married. And there was a little church in Georgetown. We didn't have any money. And this church offered us an opportunity for a very affordable, like 150 bucks to get married, which was about our, you know, I'm a bartender. She was a secretary. But they asked if we'd go out on this truck to uh, be part of their thing called the Great Patrol, G-R-A-T-E, people that went around and served food on the grates of D.C. And okay, cool. If we can get married here for 150 bucks, I'll do whatever you want. Um, and we went out. And on the way out, there was this, um, I was looking at the food that we were going to serve that night. And, you know, it was, it was um, you know, white bread sandwiches and, and Oreos and, and bananas. But that's where they got it. And it was a very expensive grocery store. And I'm like, wow, I work in an industry that throws away a ton of food every night. You know, huh. If somebody could just figure out how to get that food, you could feed more people better food for less money. But when we arrived in front of the White House, you could park in front of the White House back in the day. It was a rainy night. And uh, there was a long line of people down the street and up around the corner waiting for this truck as they did night after night after night. And I was just nervous. I was burdened, as most people are, by bigotries and stereotypes of who, is, who I'm going to encounter that night. And as we started to dutifully serve our meal, I noticed you know, two things. A, the, the, I was up in a warm truck serving people outside in the rain. And secondly, the, the idea of the, so many of the men and women I, I encountered de defied the stereotype I had of who was homeless. But I kept thinking the whole time, this model, as, as, as historic as it is, and is wrapped up in, in seeming love, is based on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And that idea of all my businesses have been based on that idea of like, no, 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 everything must be tethered to a, a demonstrated power of, of the liberation of the receiver. But going to make this pertinent for you all, I also launched at the beginning of, the, of cable and internet. And suddenly CNN and C-SPAN and 24-hour news came and they were hungry for a story. And here I was getting food from the, our first day, opening day was uh, the inauguration of George Bush Sr., uh, January 20th, 1989. And so what media outlet could resist food going from presidential inaugurations down to shelters? And as I eventually built the first training kitchen, the very first job training program for, culinary program for the homeless, uh, presidents used to come and visit. And the, and the historic visual that you would see on Thanksgiving and other holidays was the president on one side of a table serving 
people across the table who were in effect waiting for the benign charity of like, oh, be grateful for this big turkey, groaning turkey dinner. And our model was like, fuck that. No, but we're gonna bring everybody around the same side of the table so that when presidents come, they'll see the idea of a kid who has to do service hours, who might begrudgingly say, I've got to get some service hours in, but to create a place where that kid felt like, wow, I'm doing something, an elder. And every day, 10,000 people in America turn 70 every single morning. And keeping an older generation um, that I might add also is probably next to the millennials, the richest, freest, most educated generation in the history of the planet, but also that has the best soundtrack to the history of the um, <coughs> Keeping them active and productive it could be someone who's home, again, a returning citizen who might spend 20, 30 years in prison, or it might be an addict who lived on the street most of their life and is struggling to think that after one year, two years of sobriety, they can hold on and keep it going. But in the middle was the President of the United States, next side by side, and the power, that moment of communication where all the media in the world would be, would be there. And I would urge you to ponder this because we had two choices. We could have said, this is great. Let's make sure it's all about us. Let's make sure that what we do in this moment is to get as much money as we can and say, aren't we great, send us money? Or could we, in effect, reflect that on the broader nonprofit sector? And could we, in this magic moment where the President of the United States, and again, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, smart dudes, didn't know how to cut a carrot. You know, and this powerful moment where someone who was in our job training program, and it might have been there for three weeks, in this magic moment, I know more than the President of the United States, and I can teach him. You know, and then the media, for the media to be able to see that, and for the average citizen to say, to see this equitable situation in which the, the inherent message was, we've tried everything but working together. And the only way we can get by the idea that charity, we can't solve, I gave up long ago. I, can't, I can feed a lot of people every day, but I can't solve hunger, period. So my only recourse is to demonstrate new ideas powerfully. And the, the core idea was, you know, we're never going to solve anything unless we work together. And whether it's the President of the United States or someone in the biggest homeless shelter in America, they are citizens of the same city. And it only works if we work side by side. And that idea of how can we, through our communications, show people what they think is, is impossible sometimes is actually the, sometimes, you know, the goal they seek is right at their feet. Our communities are so rich beyond measure, but I think we are as a sector, and so many of the people we serve are so beat down. I think we think sometimes it's, 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 it's almost an impossible feat what we're trying to do. We only have 15 minutes left, and I, I do oh, want us to have some, some time to address any questions yeah, or dude. comments that you may have. Um, I guess we should probably talk about, like, what do we, now that we have a room full of communications professionals, right. like, well, um, what, would, what advice would we give you or what do we ask of you? I think like right now for me, right, you all are communication professionals and you're amazing. You are so important in our sector. And I think you need to own your power and the ability that you have to communicate with people and, and use that, those skills that you have to move beyond the BS, right? It's no longer good enough to just like use your communication skills just to serve your own mission anymore. The missions are all interrelated. And so we have, we've got to start thinking about the entire sector. And we also need to start embracing like the sort of, like the equity, the 201 stuff, right? There's been still a lot of communication stuff that we just need to, like we just need to be doing better. You know, I still see a lot of communications or videos that don't have caption when we know that uh, deaf or hard of hearing colleagues may not be able to access those, right? Um, so we, we just, we got to do a much better job with just making communications more accessible and as a default, because I feel like we have to just like move, like just have those things done because we got to move forward because right now there's a whole bunch of stuff at stake. Abortion rights for sure, right? Climate change is something that we need to be focused on. And I don't want us to be so entrenched in our own, like our own individual siloed work that we don't look up and say it's like, Shit, like everything is, we might not have a future. <laughs> we might not have anything to write about later on, right? And I think, I think we just need you all to kind of snap out of it. I also would encourage you to kind of be disconnected from this, like the fundraising aspect of it. I feel like so much of communications has been to serve fundraising in this Hunger Games for funding. Like how do you communicate so that we can get more funding? versus how do we actually communicate so that we can actually get the messages of our sector out there and its important work 
and to lift up some really critical issues in, in our sector that we need the, the public to focus on. Oh, yeah, fuck yeah. No, I'm with you, dude, because it's like, you know, again, we are a balkanized sector, and, and I would just urge you to, if you had the opportunity to again say, we are one of many. No matter how good I am, I am one of many. I am so proud of being part of the nonprofit sector in America. Even though I hate that name, nonetheless, I just, I am proud of my association with so many groups I've met. But I would urge you to also remember, we are, as Vu said earlier, we are the third biggest employer in America. We have 14 million voters who work in our sector. We control, not control, but we channel the energy of 60 million volunteers. We have almost 500 billion in annual revenue, and we have four trillion in assets. Yet when was the last time you heard a presidential candidate or a governor candidate talk about the nonprofit sector with any depth of knowledge? Now again, if I was, if Vu and I were here and we were CEOs of a major company, you were the shareholders and our company was struggling and we got up here to talk, but we didn't talk about how our recovery plan was going to include our third biggest division, you would fire us. Yet we elect people who, who blatantly display a lack of knowledge. Do you know the nonprofit sector is one of the major sources of outside investment dollars coming into every single community in America? You know, and now imagine an intelligent mayor who said, I get it, and I want to partner with the nonprofit sector to bring more money in, to create more jobs. Because again, we're the kind of people, whether we're nonprofit social enterprises or B Corps, our entire model is based on we're going to pay a good wage, we're going to source locally, we're going to reinvest profits. We have the potential to be the ace in the sleeve that most mayors don't even know they have. So that idea of, of, again, while it's important to pitch our own brand, the essential need, in my opinion, is to really elevate that we as a sector are a dynamic, essential economic partner, and you cannot make money without us, but Lord knows you can make a ton more with us. And it can be a, the, way, with the way we make our money can actually decrease the need for charity. So we don't have to pay to feed people leftover food from restaurants anymore because they earn enough money. There's equitable housing that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. These are the goals we should have, but we'll only get it through, I think, collective action. And political organizing. Yeah, yeah. and political organizing. Anyway, dude, we talked a lot longer than I thought, and I, I know there's probably some questions here. I don't know whether they have the mics, so just, just stand up and use your fuck yeah voice and, uh, and, and ask a question if you have one. Please. Yes. And please introduce yourself. Hi there. Um, oh, my name is microphone. Jessica, and I work for Days for Girls International. And I, one of the things that I am really interested in that I, I would, you kind of touched on briefly, is corporate capture of nonprofits. I feel like corporations have captured our government, they've captured our journalism, and now it feels like they're capturing the nonprofit sector because. Um, a large percentage of our funds come from corporate partners, and then they tend to direct our communications in a way that serves their brand and doesn't actually serve our mission or our cause or our brand. And so how do you, how do you work within that tension of trying to meet the needs of your beneficiaries and raise the money that you need and um, advance your cause? And a lot of corporations are investing in nonprofits now to, you know, to advance their brand. So how do you, I don't know, I'm just hoping you can talk to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, if they were doing a really good job, I'm like, go ahead and do it. You know, you probably cause all these problems with worker exploitation and not paying your taxes and stuff. So if you want to solve the issues that you cause, by all means, go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, like we can all quit our jobs and become wedding singers like we've always dreamed about. <laughs> That's fine. But the reality is that they're not going to be able to solve these issues. And because we've been very nice, we, we do not push back. And we, we've had, I think we've been trained to have this sort of gratitude, this attitude of gratitude. I really cannot stand the attitude of gratitude. All right? I, I, I think that it's ridiculous. And we need to stop being grateful for any dollar amount that we get or any sort of partnership or sponsorship or whatever and start looking at this bigger picture of like, why is this problem even here in the first place? And usually it's gonna be because of capitalism that the problem is there. Yeah, thank you, you can clap for that, right? And so once you, I, I feel like, again, we're, we're just way too humble, so don't, we don't push back. I think we have to be willing to lose some funding and some donors but, and some yeah. partners. Like we cannot do this work if we're always beholden to these corporations. Like, we just can't be. So I would say, go ahead and be louder and when you can. 
And the reality is that those of us who have more privilege have to be a little bit louder because it's always been like women of color who've always, especially who've like been loud and get punished for it. So we, the men and, you know, um, white folks and so on, we need to be a lot louder and to take the flack sometimes to push back on these inequitable policies and partnerships. You know, it's understandable. I mean, it's natural that we want the big, the big prize. We want the hundred, you know, hundred million dollar check versus the thousands of ten dollar checks. But that's where the real action is. You know, it's rank and file people. And I think sometimes our, our marketing and the way we talk about ourselves to a certain extent isn't based on that idea of how can I get regular rank and file people not only to donate but to be active participants. And that's why, again, I've always loved kitchens because you can attract tons of people into a kitchen. It's where everybody goes to the party. But that idea, though, of, of having to, to say no, and it's hard, believe me, brothers and sisters, I know it's very hard to say no to a big funder, but the, at the end of the day, what we've seen, particularly after 2008, is the groups that survive were the groups that, the big money, that in effect is holding our movements hostage. I'm gonna be blunt, I, you know, I, I'm at that age where fuck it, I don't care, I don't, you know, if I don't get a gig, I'm not gonna go hungry. But Feeding America, food banks, Walmart is their biggest donor. Walmart's their biggest funder, and their CEO was the former CFO of Walmart. Are they going to talk about wage? You know, our food bank's going to talk about wage, which is the number one reason that people are hungry is they don't get paid enough. You know, this is the voice we should be saying, that we'll take your money, but we will not be silent about the issue. You know, so that idea of having the courage, and I think it is, we're in the bravery business. So to a certain extent, we need to have the courage. And I know you all are communications, and oftentimes you've got a CEO and a board that is like, no, that's not the way we're going to talk about our beloved partners. Um, but there's got to be, to me, whether, whether it's through Twitter, whether it's through TikTok, or whether it's a thousand new media forums that actually are the vehicles in which people watch now, not the New York Times op-ed page, you know, but that idea of we have to be much more honest and open and brave about pushing back. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on, sister. Hi, my name is Kristen Alice. I'm from Hope Services Hawaii. We're a, a homeless services nonprofit on the Big Island. Also alumni of World Central Kitchen when y'all were there for the 2018 eruption. Right Thank on. you. Um, that's why I have my job today. My question oh. is, have you seen an example of a coalition that successfully pushed back against these like Karen and Kevin-ish Sky Mall shopping funders? <laughs> Even if they weren't totally successful, have you seen the little starts of the success? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's lots of really cool stories that, that are inspiring. I think, for example, of the 180 executive directors over here who banded together at, at the beginning of the pandemic and said, look, our communities are suffering, and you need to double the amount of money that you're giving out, and it needs to be multi-year general operating dollars, and et cetera, and you need to sign this pledge. And I think about a dozen funders actually said, okay, yeah, we will we'll double up the amount of money that we're giving out, right? So pushing back, I think we need to do a lot more collective organizing. I, I feel like that would be, I, it would be amazing to have like a, a bunch of um, communications folks getting together and setting you know, some standards for the sector, like, like what kind of communication we'll be doing that will be ethical for, for, the, for the sector, right? And when do we say no to things? And also, I think we have a lot of assumptions of like the fragility of donors and corporate partners and so on when maybe those are not always accurate. Um, I, I think that you know, we have this belief that if we push back, we would lose funding. Um, but the reality is, is that actually even true? Right on. I think like Girl Scouts of Washington or one of these Girl Scout branches, they had a donor who was just like, I'll give you $100,000 if you promise not to serve transgender girls. And they went on, they were like, no, hell no. Like, and then they went on, I think they went to, to their social media and they were like, we got this asshole donor <laughs> who said this and we said, fuck you. And I wasn't there, I'm just paraphrasing what they said, right? <laughs> and, you know, can you help us raise $100,000 that they would have given us? And they raised $300,000. Yeah, right on. Right. Over here in Seattle, we had an, an amazing organization that like, sent out an email to their, all their donors, um, thousands of them, and said, you know, we support defunding the police, we support Black Lives Matter, and they knew they were gonna lose some funders and donors, and they did. And they lost a bunch of donors, but guess what? They gained 10 times more, because people were so energized by it, and that was like their best fundraising year ever. 
So we have to be like get out of our fear zone here. That I feel like we've been we had this learned helplessness from years and years of being told you can't do advocacy, you can't stand up for what's right. You just gotta like maintain the status quo and help where you can. And it's time for us to break out of that. And I would agree completely because bravery is rewarded. I think that we underestimate that if you risk, it's only sometimes with real risk that you get the reward you seek. So I, I think there's a million ways to say it, but it's like we have nothing to lose and everything to gain by trying to shake our chains free a little bit. Because, and it's, and it's, it's almost self-imprisonment. You know, we've said we can't do this because the funders... Uh, but they need us more than we need them. I mean, at the end of the day, we're the ones who, for better or worse, give people that, that redemption of the giver construct that we should be pushing back on. It's, dude, I need redemption. I'm a sinner, and I'm a joyful sinner. But the point is, I need redemption too, but just not at the expense of another human being. And if it's done well, everybody rises together. And I think we can give corporations an opportunity to be partners in, in justice, but we should not be hostage to charity. No. Fuck yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think this might be our last question here. Hi, I'm Linda Wendell from the CareStar Foundation. Um, we're a small startup foundation that's really fortunate enough to work um, bravely. We, we are an endowed foundation, so we're not tied to any fundraising needs, and we have the benefit um, of some freedom to think big and to move outside that fear zone that you talked about. One approach that we've started to embrace is this idea of trust-based philanthropy and sharing more power with our, grant, our grantees. I'm curious what advice you have for um, those of us who are trying to engage in more participatory grant making and engaging people with lived experiences in grant and even operational decisions and how we can do that respectfully, authentically, while still honoring kind of the governance structure that many of us have been formed under. Do you mind if I jump in? Yes, go ahead. Um, you know, one of the, the, the greatest, I think, betrayals uh, of our sector's destiny is that virtually every grant agreement that we sign says none of this money will be used for advocacy. And I think when, they, when we put pen to paper and say we will take your dollars, but we will do nothing, you know, we will submit to the idea that all we can do is, is again, feed people leftover food from restaurants versus fighting the root cause of why there are people in line for food in the rain in front of the capital of the United States and the freest, richest country in the world. Um, I think the, the, the first foundation that says, in effect, 10% of every grant must be used for advocacy. And we will, we will train every single part of our responsibility is we will actually train all of our grantees in not only in advocacy within their own issue, but collective advocacy. That is one of the great liberations of our sector, is to abolish, just as in my business, the ban the box, the idea that a computerized application form would say, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And the idea that somebody who had paid their debt to society had to check that box, which meant their application got spit out. A lot of us collectively work to get ban the box, to, to get rid of that. This is the same thing. That box or that, that caveat in every grant agreement is the barrier to real significant change. And I would urge you, if that is part of your grant making process, to, to think as, a, as an organization, is it time for us to not only get rid of that, but to actually realize that policy and advocacy is the only way we're gonna mitigate some of these issues and we're gonna train people to be warriors for that. Thank you. Mm. We're running out of time and uh, so I'll, I, I just wanna answer that by, by saying like, we need our funding partners right now to really step up. And participatory grant making is great. And you know, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the different things that funders are doing. For example, some funders are now just accepting a grant proposal that you wrote for another foundation. Just accept it. I know a lot of trust-based um, philanthropy type um, foundations are, are doing that. They accept a proposal or a, a grant report. But the reality is that this is not enough. Those are like the bare minimum. What we need to do is like really pay out more, right? Like this endowment thing, like what are you saving for? You're saving for a rainy day when it is pouring. Fuck You're saving yeah. for a future that may not exist for anyone except rich white men right now. So I would encourage foundations to really like give out way more money right now. Go broke. To, yes, go broke, sunset, 
and also really focus that funding into communities that are, that are most affected by systemic injustice. Stop this sort of like hunger games. You know, like oftentimes participatory grant making becomes another form of hunger games. But instead of like the capital choosing who's the winner, we force the tributes to choose amongst themselves. And so I feel like we need to be stop being distracted by some of the red herrings. Foundations need to, foundation, progressive foundations need to fund the way that conservative foundations have been funding successfully for decades now. Like they don't spend all this time in toxic intellectualizing with snowflake grant applications and logic models and shit like that. Yeah. And they're just like, you know what? We know that we do this, we will get Supreme Court justices, we will get all these federal judges, and that will affect everything for the next several decades. That's how we should be thinking right now, and we need communication professionals right on. to help with it. Right on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that note, um, beloved friends, colleagues, brothers, and sisters, thank you so very much for the opportunity to um, see a dear friend uh, and to speak a little bit of truth uh, with you all today and to enjoy this beautiful, great American city. So thank you all thank very, you very, very much. Fuck yeah. yeah. Indeed. That was awesome, and I think I won the bet, Robert. I, we had a little wager going how many F-bombs are going to get dropped, so they achieved their quota. Uh, how's everybody feeling? Do you know what the plan is going ahead? Many of you are, are drifting out, and that's exactly the right thing to do. Chances are you're going to get lunch, and maybe you're going to run into some of your colleagues, and they're going to come in. The next session, in case you haven't checked it in the app or you're, you're not quite clear where we are in the schedule, is we've invited a number of leading sector CEOs to sit down and have a conversation and share what they've learned over the last couple of years that we've all been apart through the pandemic. What are the, specifically, what are the communications lessons that they've learned and how do they think about that from their perch as not only CEO, but maybe even more importantly in this moment and in this age that we live in, communicator in chief. So that's gonna get underway in just a quick minute. You're gonna see some folks up here on stage adding a couple chairs. Uh, a quick reminder for those of you who have friends at home, we're streaming all of this that's happening on the main stage on the Chronicle of Philanthropy website. So if you have some folks who wanna check in, you can do it over there. The other thing I wanna call out for folks who are still in the room is a gentleman sitting right up in front of me. Chances are you've seen his poster outside the door. I believe it says, we have a dream. Uh, he is responsible for much of the dream speech that we were all taught or we've come to know over the course of our lives. This is Dr. Clarence B. Jones. He is an American hero. He is family to us here at the network. And he had your job at a time when we didn't give the names communications directors or things of that nature to people doing the work. Uh, but we are grateful he is with us. We have posters that we have made up through our friends at Amplifier, and I suspect his hand might get a little tired, but would you be willing to sign a few of those for folks if they bring them by? All right, so please come visit with Dr. Jones, and tomorrow we're going to get a chance to hear from him right before we uh, award the 2022 Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. All right, with that, I'm going to let the fellas come on up here, set up the stage, and then Carmen, Carol, and Dr. Bell will be with us uh, in just a quick moment along with Stacy. Stand by. <laughs> 